Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Now, it's time for me and our good friend, Russell Tammany, to take a look at a crazy camera that we just bought. Yes. <laughs> we both bought one. We, you first, right? Well, we sort of, you know, these cameras are very similar, so... Um, this let's, is, let's set you let's, up with what, sort of, what we started yeah, with, because exactly. you use a Canon one. I, I have a one DX. One DX, which is this I've is reviewed that as well. For a Google very TV. popular camera that I use, very popular with pros. This is the five D. This is a Mark II, but they're all about the same size. Right. We're talking big, heavy cameras, big, heavy lenses, and the, the reason people go out and buy these cameras is the sensor. It's what they call a full frame sensor essentially the size of a 35 millimeter right piece so you of get film. you get a full large sensor but the downside is that then um, yeah you've got a huge tank and the the 1dx is even larger right and so i had the nex7 which i also reviewed for before you buy um let's let me and, just say, and, you know, say that, that was like my smaller camera mm -hmm. but there's two there's one way really to get this much smaller which is eliminate the mirror if you right. look in digital SLRs, in fact, all SLRs traditionally have had a prism in these that acts as a mirror that allows the light from the lens to come up through into the viewfinder, and, and so that you can see the uh, what you're what through the lens what you're going to get a picture of. But that that is a big old mirror that you have to move out of the way. So lately, we've seen a number of mirrorless solutions. Instead of having an optical uh, prism that has to be moved up out of the way, adding to the size and the complexity of the body, uh, these cameras now use uh, electronic viewfinder, essentially a right. video tap that looks through the lens. And then you see what the camera is going to see through the viewfinder. We, we want to put this back on because yeah, that's I, the actual sensor in that's there. That's the actual sensor. You might want to put I'm your lens back on there. Over, uh, <laughs> the you know what's worst? Somebody told me micro spittle. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't want to get anything wet or anything oily or right. greasy in there. And spit there. is a little acidic, so it can yeah. actually etch the uh, surface of your full frame. Yeah. So this so, is exciting. We, yeah. As you mentioned, the NEX, I uh, bought an Olympus OMD, OMD right. uh, which is a micro four-thirds. Your NEX7 is an APS-C sensor. Right. It was a small sensor but as well. These, these small cameras have, until now, except for the very, very high-end uh, cameras, uh, have... Like for yeah, instance, yeah, there's been a couple of like uh, what fixed uh, full frame. Like yeah, Sony was it the uh, RX one? And or what's something the really like what's the really expensive there, one? I can um, always forget uh, the name of it because I don't want to. I don't want to think about it. Leica, like that's it. M8 or something. Yeah, the, so I they've had full frame sensors, yeah. but it's very rare in the mirrorless right. sphere. Then Sony, yes, put the world in a tizzy last fall. So so Sony said we're we're going to put a huge sensor in our kind of mirrorless body, and nobody had done that before and it's exciting for a lot of reasons because it means you don't have to carry around that huge camera to get a full frame quality uh, picture and it's the one thing where you know I have a full frame camera and it's large and I have to decide is it worth big bringing around the huge 5D Mark III, the 1DX, um, especially if you're traveling, uh, you know, it's just a lot more to go with. Well, in fact, just the we, battery charger for my 1DX is larger than this entire camera. The preview versions of this, this is the, you have the A7, right. I have the A7R, we'll talk about the differences in a second, but the preview versions of these cameras were seeded out to some of the world's best known photographers yeah. to universal raves. There, there was a lot of sort of hype and a lot of, um, you know, pre-ordering. I think I got my pre-order in like a day after it was announced yeah. or the same day. So Trey uh, Ratcliffe, uh, very famously, who had just recently given up his full bodied Nikon oh, right. DSLRs for the <clears throat> Sony NEX cameras, went the next step, gave them up for this. He is now the, there is a point to be made with this that he is a landscape photographer. Right. But he's decided Trey Ratcliffe has decided to do all of his shooting now with his A seven R. He was right. using a D eight hundred and a D eight hundred E, and this is actually the same sensor as in the Nikon D eight hundred E. Yeah. So I think it's an easy transition for him to make. Yeah, and this is very similar to the D eight hundred. So Let, you're you're essentially getting a cheaper version of that. Yeah, because that's like a three um, or four thousand dollar body, it, right? Yeah. yeah. This, so so the A seven, um, this body only retails for uh, around seventeen hundred dollars, like sixteen ninety eight, somewhere around there. Um, and there's a kit version that's also available that has a twenty eight to seventy. Uh, kind of zoom lens, but it also has optical stabilization. So you can get it in a kit with a lens, which is probably what most people are going to do if it's their only camera. But I'm so sort it's about of a two thousand with the lens. Yeah, it's about two thousand with the lens. But I'm a fan of buying the body and then just using either my existing lenses or picking exactly what I want. I don't necessarily want what is in a kit lens. Um, what are the specs of that so A7? So the, the specs on the A7 is that you get 
a 24.3 megapixel full frame sensor with 14 bit raw. And uh, so that it's already quite large. The A7R, I believe, is 36, but yeah. it's, it's a little bit higher. Um, you do get a phase detect autofocus, which is really nice in the A7 because it means that in the actual sensor, there are phase detect um, for high quality autofocus. So it's a little better at you know, acquiring an accurate autofocus or continuous tracking and for things like that. Um, does about five frames a second. And um, you have a lot of great features. Uh, the electronic viewfinder, I had this on the NEX7, and it was a little laggy, a little kind of floaty and blurry, especially in lower light. And they've significantly improved it in the A7. And, I, and the A7R has the same viewfinder as well. So the big difference between the A7 and the A7R is that this is 39 megapixels. Yeah, 39. Uh, it's a larger, uh, it's the same sensor, both full frame sensors, right. but it's just a higher resolution. That's not necessarily a pro. You're going to get better low light performance, for instance, on the A7. Right, so the, the, the low light and high ISO performance is a little bit better on the A7 than the A7R. Yeah. But the A7R also removes the anti-aliasing filter. That's like the, the D800E. Which is like the D800E. And now there's pros and cons to that. It means right. that moireing is more likely, right? Right. So uh, with a shirt like what Leo's wearing right now, it's got a very fine kind of linen pattern. You probably to can't it. even see it. You probably can't see it on the on the cameras, but that's the kind of pattern that can show in certain um, certain environments a kind of moire effect, which is looks sort of like a rainbow. Yeah. And the issue with that is that that's something that you can't really correct later in RAW easily. There are, you know, removal software and things like that, but it's something that's not as simple as a simple vignetting or distortion or now, another correction. I should point out, this doesn't happen that often. Right. You would be able to see it in the electronic yes, viewfinder. And, and then a minor adjustment to the zoom yeah. or the focus would and, generally and the, fix that. The benefit is that you don't get this essentially blur filter that it's is placed softening. over. It's a softening filter yeah. that's placed over the sensor. So the issue is that you're trading, you're trading the phase detect sensors for the lack of an AF uh, uh, filter. So, so that okay. That's a side so effect. So that's the side so, effect. So there's two you two things. You no longer have the anti moire, and you no longer have phase detect well, focusing. Well, so you lose the phase detect focusing when you do the A7R, which this is the uses one that, right. Peak so that focusing. uses contrast. Contrast. And yeah. And so the the regular A7 still has the phase detect, um, which means it should be more accurate for focusing. Um, however, I felt it was still a little slow, and it's it's not the kind of thing. Either of these cameras are not going to be the kind of thing you're going to see at the Olympics for sports. They're not very they're, fast. They're not very yeah. fast. Now, one of the other things that people really liked about this, uh, I'll, I'll give you a negative right up front. There are only currently two lenses available. You can use the NEX uh, E lenses, right. but Which they're cropped. cropped because it's right. an APS sensor. So if you want to take advantage of the full Oops. frame sensor, don't worry. That's just an eight uh, eight thousand dollar lens. It's no big deal. If you want to use the, if you want to use the, uh, we'll, we'll put we'll put that up uh, on something more stable. <laughs> uh, if you want to use um, uh, other third party lenses, you can use an adapter. I have there are a number of companies that make these. This is a Metabones adapter, about four hundred dollar adapter. Which I which I have the same adapter. It allows so that I can use my camera. And they make this for a variety of lenses. I'm using here. These are the same lenses I use with my uh, Canon 5D Mark II. These right. are the good Canon L lenses with the adapter. What's nice about the Metabones adapter, unlike some of them, is that all the electronics still work. Yes. You'll, so you'll autofocus, keep everything. Autofocus, but uh, what's not aperture. so nice is really slow. Yes. So slow that you almost always end up using manual focus. Right. And now that is one of the things that these cameras are very good at is manual focus. They have a, one feature is an auto zoom on the uh, EVF that lets you see very closely. Right. The pe uh, you don't have peaking in yours, uh, no, do you? No, these do peaking they as do. well. Okay. The, the so that's the other thing. I mean, uh, you would think, you know, if this was a Canon, Canon would limit the features and firmware of what is in the A7 compared to the A7R, because it's, it's just sort of what they do when right. you look at the different lineups of Canon. That does everything this that does the R everything does. everything that the R does. So, it so has peaking is nice. The, so the peaking. Me, it'll um, show you uh, where it's focused, and, and it'll light up right. where it's so what peak it, focused. What it does is, if you haven't seen it before, is it, it highlights high contrast edges. So it's sort of like running a, a edge detection and a contrast detection. And it will, along the trim, so like you would see if you were looking at, at me through this um, sort of peaking filter, as you were manually focusing forward and back, you would see that the most in focus is going to have little peaking along all the contrast cool. areas. You'll have little like ridges of the color that you choose, and you can choose white, red, or uh, yellow. The point being, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds on the pros and cons. I, I think we should start yeah. talking about how we use it. But the point being, 
manual yes. focus is actually a very relatively easy thing to do yeah. in here. And I, I've been using, I've gone from using autofocus all the time on the on the back button AF right. um, on my you know 1D and my 5Ds to for the last couple uh, trips I took the A7 on. 99% manual focus. Not so great on and horse races or lacrosse no, tournaments. But, but for what I was doing, it it was actually really nice. It, well, and that's my point. In the way. One of the reasons a person like Trey Ratcliffe really likes this camera is he's doing landscapes. Yeah. And if the if you're using a tripod and you don't have to, if you're not shooting birds in flight, you don't have to. You know, the autofocus is a little slow, even on using the the uh, the actual yeah, so lenses, native lenses yeah. the native lenses, the so-called FE lenses, full frame E lenses. So. I guess the point I would make is there's only two native lenses right now. They're good. This is the there's probably the best of them. This is a 55 millimeter 1.8. Right. There's also a what is it a 30? There's a 35. 28? I want to say a 28 one. There's a 28 35 zoom and then there, anyways. There's there's a couple that's available now. There's 12 in the roadmap and there's through two or three that are coming out in the next couple months. The roadmap going to the end of next the year. Roadmap but goes they to are the end promising year, a lot of lenses. I've got a lens on. Here's the first thing I would say is. While a lot of people, including Trey, talk about using adapters and using their beautiful right. Leica lenses on this thing, be aware that you're probably going to be doing manual focus. It's going to be like you do with a Leica. It's going to be a little bit finicky, a little bit fussy. And it's for somebody who's willing to take the time. I've decided it's just too much work for me. You, I'm going to use the stock if lens. If you see on this side one. by side, it also where has significantly you have the, the bulk. adapter on it. Yeah, it has to push, at, you know, essentially the lens out. <laughs> right, so you end up with this huge lens, and what's happening is that you can't simply mount a lens that was designed for a system with a mirror box directly to a mirrorless right. camera. And that's why you have it's to stage it out, because you would lose your infinity focus. So if you were able to somehow tape the lens directly onto the camera, you would not have the ability to focus in. Having anymore. said that, so the, the combination of the the uh, Zeiss lens is a right. very good. This 55 is millimeters is the one I'd recommend. Lens. With this body, makes a very compact, very nice shooter. I mean, the full yeah. frame really you notice it. It's very good, but it's finicky. You know, I these I've seen. Well, they went to the, so they went with this retro design, right? So I like the design. I don't mind all the dials. It, it went a little retro, and they decided yeah. they did some good things. Like they got rid of the NEX7 um, kind of consumer menu, and they went to a, a more professional menu system that would be what you find on the regular Sony Alphas. It's very similar to Nikon and, and Canon menus. Um, but they made some decisions with the, with the body and handling where um, you know, the, the shutter button is right on top of the on-off switch. And it's in a very traditional location if you're on a film like an F-series uh, Nikon film camera. However, it's always a little awkward. You, know, you, you hold the camera now and you want in your grip, that's where your shutter is. But yeah. instead, it's, it's up here. You have to reach around and sort of change the placement from what's natural. There have been some legitimate little dials and, and there have been some legitimate complaints about the ergonomics. Some of the buttons yeah. are hard to reach. Um, and the electronic viewfinder, as good as it is, has an automatic sensor that, that bothers decides you. it yeah. decides you want to look through the viewfinder. You want to look at the screen on well, the Well, when back. you put your eye up to it, uh, it, the default would be, of course, the LCD. Right. And it's a very, very good high-resolution LCD. But then when I put my eye up to the sensor, it will switch to the sensor. Right. But, and you, can and you see, have a hard time? You right, find that you, not? If you turn that around and, and uh, you're gonna accidentally. show it to the camera, anytime you, you <laughs> we have studio lights, so it's a little harder. But no, anytime, I'm doing it just with my finger, yeah. You, you can just sort of cover it. And so what <laughs> happens is if you're trying to shoot low, like if, right. you've, if you've got the, so you've got the, the tilt LCD. I like that too. And so if you're trying to shoot low, if you're trying to shoot in and tight and do like, you know, some work like this, it'll keep blinking right. off, especially in, in dark conditions. And there's no manual uh, button? There is a manual button, but it takes you to the menu, which then right. forces you to scroll through the menu to select between Not auto and, you yeah. know. But it's, it's that sort of Sony thing where everything is buried in the menu settings. and So let, let's... You can set it up, but... There's a lot to be said, and I don't want to... So, we could so spend an hour stuff, on this. Yeah, so photo stuff, you know, it all really works exactly as you expect. It takes fantastic raw photos. Um, these JPEGs, are, these are some according to DP Review, have been very poor. I, yeah, I don't never ever set, shoot JPEGs, so I never I don't set know. my stuff to JPEG yeah. in the first place. Don't buy this to shoot JPEGs. These are some photos that I shot. I've had the camera for a couple months, and I've, I took it to uh, San Antonio. I took it to Puerto Rico and to Paris. And so it, it's been my travel camera now. And I had, I've always had regrets when I bring my NEX, when I bring a point and shoot, when I even bring the small NEX? cameras. Even the NEX, it's not as good. Right. And and it's and you don't have the depth of field. You don't look have at the, the depth effect. of field here. It's really it's, nice. It's yeah. really fantastic. So I I can honestly say that 
I was able to go and, and use the camera and not think about, you know, you think about some of the little issues, but you don't think, I wish I had my 1DX. I wish I had a 5D Mark III. I can't take this picture without it. The and quality the, is the, the superb. The quality is superb. And so not have, you know, having that, that being said, the video features, I don't have a, a video to show. However, this checks every single box that you would really want to have for video on a DSLR. Yeah. And so, um, including you know, external microphone inclu capability. Yeah. So you get you get external microphone, you get uh, headphones, you get um, audio levels. You can is, actually see meters you can see on meters, the screen. meters, which is missing from a lot. Mm -hmm. You also get, which is super important, clean 1080p uh, video output, which means it's uncompressed. You can use a Blackmagic recorder. You can use an Atomos from uh, uh, the or a Atomos Ninja or Samurai or something like that. Um, Key Pro. You can basically get extremely high quality video directly out of the camera. Um, and you know, it will also do you know, all the regular um, higher compression settings like in camera, you can get your MPEG-4, you can get high bit rate, like 28 something megabit MPEG-4. And the video looks really good, but when you look at the uncompressed video out, it's sort of like the difference between the Blackmagic cinema cameras and you know, a regular point and shoot type video. So it's really good. It's really good. And it's it doesn't have the full bit depth that the Blackmagic Cinema camera has, but if you have the exposure right, you can get really good results from the video. So let's wrap it up on the pros and cons. And I have a feeling we're gonna agree pretty much on the pros and yeah. cons. So the pros, excellent image quality, excellent yes. video. Excellent video quality. quality. Uh, I guess you could say a pro, the fact that you could use a broad variety of lenses yeah. the, the, with the, this. The third party lens adapters, you can adapt everything to this because it has the They've shallowest registration yeah. distance. So every yeah. single other type of lens right. is capable of being adapted to it. But that leads us to one of the negatives, which is... Which is no Sony lenses. <laughs> there are very few actual <laughs> manufacturers' <laughs> ice lenses, right. and uh, the other lenses tend to be very slow. Right. I'll give you another negative that is not on your A7, but is on the A7R, is the shutter. Oh, and yeah. a number of people complain... See, uh, I've never heard that shutter. So. so this is... If you listen, the shutter sound, it's, it is... There's a two-click sound. Right. That's one picture. That's one picture. And uh, some have noted that it actually is such a big physical click, because there is a physical right. thing going on, that it might jiggle the camera a little bit. Right. And uh, yours, let's hear yours. So this is on the, on the A7, and it just has a single, uh, it has a digital first curtain. So. so when you hear that, okay, that's the end. That's the second curtain. So essentially what, what your camera is doing is it's got to bring down in front of the sensor a physical shutter, start the exposure, pull it, and then put it back. Yeah. And so that's why you get that, that second curve. That gives you some flexibility, but it also jiggles the camera quite jiggles a bit. Jiggles the camera. It also makes the response time slower. It's, it so, really feels slow. So I have found, um, kind of just running around shooting with the A7, that it really, it responds extremely quickly. And, you know, it, it just, it feels really nice that way. It does have a long startup time, which I'm assuming the A7 yeah, does Yeah, this also well, does really long. Um, which is a little frustrating. And but, you can't shoot very fast with it. Yeah, uh, you, and, you got me beat. <laughs> yeah, and I'm in, I'm in continuous and like. So, and that brings up another one that is a little bit more subtle, which is that uh, if you put this in program mode or aperture mode, it's going to want to go to one sixtieth, right. and that is actually too it's slow too, yeah. for this it's, lens and this click. And uh, uh, that is a software that they could bug, that they could fix. Right. But what happens is it's, it's adjusting the ISO for trying to get to 1 right. It should really be trying to get to 1 1 and 25th or better. And, and that's the thing is I've seen a Does lot of complaints. Does yours do that also? Yes. And I've yeah. seen a lot of complaints about little nitpicky things about like, like that with the 1 60th. And it is important, but if you're aware of it, it just means, you know, I'm used to using the manual modes. I don't like auto ISO. You I don't tend like to use... I, I, I like aperture, aperture priority, priority, and you don't yeah. use aperture priority. You tend to use shutter priority right. so that you can force a faster shutter right. speed. So That's just, a little bit of a disadvantage for me because I like aperture yeah. priority. But it's, so it's something to be aware of. Right. It's a negative. There's, You're right. It's nitpicky. Th there's, so there's negatives, but the, the big nitpick is that I'm not confident that Sony will fix it. Right. Because I've had the NEX7. There's been right. multiple little issues like that. And none of them were fixed in the firmware. Um, so. so this is, and this seems to be a very common thing oh, now. Yes. We're seeing a lot of what I call diva cameras. They are amazing. The performance is incredible, but it comes at a bit of finickiness and trouble. And, and uh, I think for a lot of people, the frustrations might outweigh the benefits. Right. If you're looking for a really great full frame camera that is light and compact, gives you great images, and you're willing to put up with 
some of these little quibbles we've talked about, right. I think this is, is definitely a buy. Mine, the second negative is it's fairly pricey, although if you compare it to a D800, uh, it's a good deal. You were right. going to show, I know, the Sony wireless capability. Right. All the Sony so cameras got, now have this. All the Sony cameras have the same. So they finally added Wi-Fi and NFC, and you can just do the old... He's going to pair his phone. Put the phone next to it. And That's a the, nice the feature. Play Memories Apple launch. And you've got remote shooting. You've got... Um, so you can trigger the camera you, you from the phone. You can trigger the camera from the phone. You, you can, can copy pictures to the camera. Yes, and you get a preview every time you take it. So if it's set up on a um, on a tripod, you can you know get it. And the other wild thing is because there's Wi-Fi, I can join our Wi-Fi network yeah, and without leaving the camera, share to Flickr and Facebook. Right. So you get a live view <laughs> of <laughs> that's what kinda, the camera sees. That's so kind of great. But I don't even need to do that. I can actually from the camera. Yeah. Uh, it also has apps. Uh, the App Store isn't huge yet. Uh, the there's a time. Uh, uh, Time, uh, you know, uh, time lapse app that's right. that's good, but it's ten dollars. You know, so I'm, adding, I don't know. Are you going to give it a try, features. a buy, a don't? Buy. So I'm going to give it a buy. However, I'm still a little hesitant to recommend it if you if this is like your only camera, your first camera, and th the reason is is that you really have a lot more flexibility if you can deal with the slightly larger body size and the actual you know mirror box. You were probably better off with a D800, D600. Um, or Canon 5D Mark III, or um, or something like that, and the traditional lens lineup. You just you have a lot more flexibility if it's going to be your only camera, and you should know how amazing it is to use a optical viewfinder. Right. Um, but all that said, this is the best mirrorless camera I have used, and I've been very happy with it, and have no regrets taking it on any trips or you know missing full frame uh, camera. So it's it's a buy, you know, with those kind of. You know, you want to wait for the lenses. Sony's got a 24 to 70 f/4 OSS Zeiss lens. It's going to be fantastic. A couple other lenses will be great, but they're not out now. And you know, you know how it is. You wait six months, eight months. Maybe there'll be a a7 R Mark II. So yeah, that's that's why I'm going to say it's a don't. Early. I'm going to say don't buy the a7R. Do, uh, you'd be better off with a D800 if you want D800e if you right. want no anti-aliasing. A 5D Mark II if you really want a fast through the lens camera. This is a really interesting camera. you still get the weather sealing on these, so. It's weather still, sealed. I've got, I've got this thing really wet in a waterfall. We could go back and forth. <laughs> I think so you've heard enough, though, great. to know whether it's right for you. Yeah. Uh, a don't buy from me, a buy from buy. Russell. We really agree more than that would, right. would tell you. Uh, I just think that you should probably wait for the well, next and, generation. And I have to say that if you look between the A7R and the A7, that the A7 is a stronger buy for the price. That's probably true. And for the, the almost similar quality that's that you right. get. That's right. As well. I'd so. agree with you. Yep.